Well, for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Andrew May, and I am the Director of Youth Formation and Ministry here at Fairview, and uh, it's my honor to welcome you here this morning and give you a few announcements. Uh, first announcement, we will be having a morning of prayer and brunch on March 18th, but we're asking that you uh, RSVP so you can call the office uh, to RSVP for that. <coughs> uh, dinners for six are starting uh, here in the next couple weeks, uh, but they are already full. So I'll just let you know that. But if you do have, uh, if you did already sign up, then they will be starting in the next couple weeks and you should look out for uh, uh, info and email about that. Uh, teachers retreat on March 4th, which is this Saturday. Uh, for anyone who has taught uh, Sunday school or small groups or anything like that or has the intention of doing so, it's a great time of fellowship and being together, and we will be having a time of learning as well. So again, that is this Saturday morning, March 4th. Uh, Dan, uh, however, needs to know that you are attending, and so if you would RSVP to him or to Martha Ponder, that would be great. Those are the announcements, and now uh, let's come together for the call to worship. All of the liturgy this morning is from the Psalms, so the call to worship is Psalm 117, verses 1 and 2. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Well, thank y'all. Whoa. Is it because of where I'm standing? All right. Well, thank you all for being here this morning, and we have a wonderful opportunity to receive some new covenant partners this morning, including five of our confirmation students who came before session on Monday and gave excellent statements of faith. We were all very impressed, so thank you all for, for doing that. One of them even gave it virtually, uh, so he was on the screen. Can we air that again? Do you want to? <laughs> no, just kidding, Ethan. Uh, but they have diligently been studying. Many of y'all have helped with the class. Andrew has led the class. Many of y'all helped them by teaching in other ways as well. And some of these students we even took baptism vows for. And uh, one has yet to be baptized. And we are going to hold off on that because he wants to go in the lake uh, up, at, uh, up at Calvin's Cove. So we will schedule a time for that baptism. But that's exciting. I know we've done that, uh, done that before. And uh, we're going to be, uh, uh, so we, we, won't, we won't need to, to pull the water out quite yet, but I'd like to invite forward those five plus two others who are joining the church today as covenant partners, uh, Cadence Wright, Drew Hanna, Jonathan Castillo, Roxy Rogers, and Ethan Enter, as well as Laura Jackson and Andrew May. Laura, I know you feel young. <laughs> and Andrew, Andrew too. Uh, so we're going to ask the questions of membership, and then we're going to pray for them, and um, and we'll, uh, we'll 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 look forward to to baptism at uh, at another time. So Prince, let me stand in front of you. This is awkward. <laughs> Probably more awkward now that I said that. Right. Friends, who is your Lord and Savior? Do you trust in him, renouncing evil and sin in their ways in the world, and affirm your reliance on his grace? I do. Do you intend to be faithful covenant partners of Fairview, joining us in mission, ministry, worship, and fellowship as you are able? I do. And for the congregation, do we receive these proclamations of faith and affirm our desire and excitement about working uh, with our brothers and sisters in Christ as they grow. Will you guide them and lead them working alongside their families? And will you be encouraged and exhorted and maybe even corrected by them from time to time as well? All right. Have
having heard your affirmations, I would like to present our new covenant partners to you. Thank you all very much, and well done, and we look forward to what God leads us to in the future. You can clap. And now let me say a prayer for, uh, for our friends, our new covenant partners, and uh, then we will continue with our first hymn. And just for those of you who, we, uh, they were introduced and they received lovely Bibles uh, at the first service, and now we're starting the second service. We're having them here just so they can get in both services and see everybody. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the work that you have done and are continuing to do in the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, thank you for the joy that it is to, uh, to grow and to learn and to be taught as well. And we pray that our relationships with, with uh, those who have taken these vows can grow and that we can uh, teach and lead and be led and be taught as well. As iron sharpens iron, we look forward to the relationships that you have called us to. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us continue our worship in song.
Amen. You may be seated. Now we move to our prayer of confession and assurance of forgiveness. And I'm excited that the first thing I get to do as a new covenant partner is to remind us of what we just sang, that on the cross, he sealed our pardon, paid the debt, and made us free. And because of that, we can come to him and acknowledge sins and receive the assurance of that pardon. So let's pray together. Psalm 51, verses 1 through 10. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in the truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Let's have a time of silent confession. look up and recite with me and receive this assurance of pardon from Psalm 103 verses 1 through 4 and 11 through 12. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Amen. Please be seated. Just realized that my microphone was on, so uh, for the recording today, if we could edit out that hymn, uh, that would be great. And I'm sorry that you uh, are now traumatized with that for uh, for the remainder of your years. Uh, I will I'll do a better job of uh, muting myself um, or just singing silently in the future. Uh, this morning, uh, we uh, were hoping to have. Uh, hoping to have Tammy Butler from Community Ministries of North Augusta with us. She was unable to come. I know that quite a few of y'all have, have been very active with Community Ministries of North Augusta, which is, I, I, I know we may be accustomed to referring to them as Comona, C-M-O-N-A, uh, but uh, they are they're trying to go more and more by the title Community Ministries now. So I know that, that many of y'all have been involved with them, whether on the board or, or in other 
uh, in other facets in the past, and we rejoice that God has called us to partner with them. Actually, we were one of their, their founding congregations 30-something years, 87, 86, 80, was that? Somewhere in there. And, uh, and it's been a blessing to be able to work with, uh, work with community ministry. So we'll look forward to having Tammy here another time, but we can still pray for community ministries, and let's do that and pray for other things as well, and we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the ways that you have called us to walk alongside brothers and sisters in Christ and for the relationship that you've given us with community ministries for over three decades now. And we ask that you will uh, help us to be aware of the needs around us. And as we're about to hear in our passage for this morning, uh, you've called us to, to be sent out and dwell with others and form relationships and point to your kingdom. And we pray that uh, we can continue to do that faithfully through this partnership with community ministries, but we also pray that that partnership can help inspire us to see the needs around us, to uh, help inspire us to see how you are calling us to meet those needs, and not just through another organization, but with our own life, with our own generosity, with our own voice. We pray that you will help us to see the needs, spiritual, physical, material that exist and help us to be generous in meeting those and pointing to the work of your Holy Spirit who's ever calling us toward Jesus. We ask that we can do that and not simply in the sense of, of meeting needs but also in, in finding our ways. Let us be attuned to the gifts you've given us, the calling you've put on our hearts to be servants and followers of Jesus. Let us walk in his name and work for his sake. And in asking that, we also pray as he has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And the children may head out with Miss Margaret. Where'd she go? She's over there.
Thank you, choir. Thank you, Alan, and thank you all again for being here this morning. There is one other announcement that I need to share with you. It mostly pertains to the early service, but the rationale behind what I'm going to talk about uh, is important for all of us to hear and consider. In addition to receiving our, our confirmation students, we voted on Monday that starting with Easter, we're going to move the early service to 845 in the morning rather than 9 o'clock. And uh, I know that uh, if you, some of y'all also go to that service. We actually have a pretty somewhat decent overlap sometimes of people who may go to one or the other. Uh, but uh, that I know that pertains to that service, but it also pertains to our values as a congregation. A few years ago, we did a vision process, and, and through that, we discerned that our, our core four values are to have substance in our worship, be organic in our evangelism, meaning we value the relationships in our evangelism, which actually plays into today's sermon, and we are intertwined in our life. Uh, there are a lot of facets of that, being intergenerational, trying to offer opportunities for being together. And uh, the last one is uh, leading in our learning. We want to be led by our learning. That's where we find our leading. So substance in our worship, organic in our evangelism, intertwined in our life, and leading in our learning. And to that end, we made some changes to some things that, uh, that we do on Sunday mornings to comport ourselves with those values a little bit better. And the main place where those changes might have been seen is the 9 o'clock service, the early service. And in that service, uh, prior to that vision process, we pretty much just had uh, music and sermon. There was not really much liturgy, no prayer confession, assurance of pardon, which if you aren't confessing your sins and being assured of God's grace, then... I mean, I guess it's still a worship service, but that's a pretty core part of what we do each, uh, each morning. Uh, there was very little prayer in that service, so we, we bolstered that service with some substance, substance in our worship, with some prayers and some liturgy. Uh, the effect, though, was that we added a decent bit of time to that service, and, uh, and we also added, uh, and you've seen this in this service as well, We've added near-weekly features of our missions partners, missionaries local and global. And uh, y'all have seen that a little bit more in here if you usually come to that service. So those are the substance in our worship and organic in our evangelism. We want to highlight the relationships that we have. But as we were doing those two things, if you go to Sunday school and you come to this service and you don't go to the other service, you have seen what has happened. We have almost no time for fellowship on Sunday mornings. So we've almost sacrificed the intertwined in our life aspect and the leading in our learning. You know, quite often, if, if the first service goes, uh, goes over 10, that's a rush to get to Sunday school. You don't get a chance to talk with one another. It cuts down Sunday school time. So we, we address the first two values, the substance in our worship and organic in our evangelism, by adding more of that to our Sunday mornings, but we lost a little bit of the other two values. So uh, Session has determined to uh, move that service earlier. It doesn't have to be permanent. We're going to see how it goes, but starting with Easter Sunday, April 9th, which is also Master Sunday, so you can get out to the other Holy Week uh, that Augusta has um, a little bit earlier that way if you come to the early service. Uh, so starting with that Sunday, we're going to move that service earlier by 15 minutes, uh, we've talked with the band, the welcoming team, and the, the, a, the AV folks, and they're already here by that time anyway. Uh, so, so keep that in mind. Uh, be in prayer. Well, I guess be in prayer that it works, but be in prayer that through that we can discern whether that works and whether that at least gives us a little more opportunity to spend some time together and to, to learn as well. And, I, you know, I, I know we like to spend time together. Uh, the Wednesday night service this past week, Ash Wednesday, I almost hated to start the service because everybody was having such a good time talking and catching up with one another that uh, I thought, you know what, we, I mean, we can just do this and really enjoy it for quite a while. So thank you to, to those who, who came to that and participated that with, in that as well. But I wanted to get that announcement out there so that you know it and know the rationale behind it. 
Um, so that's, uh, I was, uh, was going to do all that in a letter and, and, and still will for those who weren't able to hear it. But uh, I hope that we find that we are living more into our core values as a result of that decision. And, and I'll be honest, um, with Kelsey singing in the band, and I, I'm, I usually work Sunday mornings. So uh, it's, it's at 8.45 this morning, I was still walking out the door with Caleb because uh, my, my phone gave up the alarm clock for Lent, apparently. <laughs> and uh, and that was, that's, you know, it's going to be a strain for, for us too. Uh, but uh, if it means that we can spend time together and learn well together, then that's certainly worth it. So thank you for listening. Uh, you're also welcome to clap as well. Which, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, as you go, may the hands of Christ tend your wounds. But no. Uh, <laughs> but okay, we do have a sermon today. And today's passage is one that, uh, other than Christmas and Easter, I have probably preached on more than any other passage in my 15 years of, of uh, ordained ministry. And, and roughly 12 years of, of preaching almost every Sunday. I just had my 500th Sunday sermon a few weeks ago and didn't even really, didn't even really register with me. But it is Luke 10, verses 1 through 12. And uh, I've, I've done it a bunch, and, and today I'm going to go with a different emphasis. I, I, mean, I did it back in September, if you remember, uh, if hopefully you remember. Uh, but I'm going to have a little bit different emphasis today than I've ever really had with it. But we will go through the passage. And, uh, and then I'm going to come back to some early verses in the passage. But before I read it, let me pray for our understanding and reception of God's word. Heavenly Father, speak to our ears, our hearts, and our minds so that we may receive your word and pursue your will. Let us hear what you are calling us to do and how you are calling us to be as you send us pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Luke 10, 1 through 12. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he was going. And as he sent them, sorry, and he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is a passage about Jesus sending his disciples, sending them to do something. We just got done with a sermon series on personal calling as we followed the story of the prophet Jeremiah. We explored personal calling. I, I, I feel like that really resonated with people and I got some, got some feedback in, in line of, the, well, for one example, uh, we are having an Exploring Your Calling class right now, and it filled up after having uh, very few sign-ups early on in, in the series. So I, I think that resonated with people in certain ways, um, and I, I, I don't think it's because the sermons were particularly good. I think it's because each of the sermons had three points. Uh, and that was, uh, that, that was uh, most helpful, perhaps. And uh, I think that uh, there's a sense of being called, at least. Regardless of your station in life or what you're doing, uh, we can resonate with being called by God to do something. It's more explicit here as we enter the season of Lent, which is normally a season of, of slowing down and of pondering and dwelling with God. It may be ironic that we've got a passage about Jesus telling people to get up and go, 
Uh, but, as I prayed earlier, as I mentioned, it's not just what God's calling us to do, but how he's calling us to be that we need to consider. And perhaps Lent is a time to consider that as we're going to be going through Luke chapter 10. So Jesus has his disciples together, and he is sending them out. And he gives them a little set of instructions. He tells them how to go. He tells them how to know whether they're going to be received. And he tells them how to show who they are and who he is. So if you want three things to take away from at least the first part of this sermon, Jesus tells his disciples, and you can look back on this through your week, how to go, how to know when they're going to be received, and how to show who they are and who he is. And as he's telling them to go, it's kind of curious. He tells them not to take a money bag, not to take a knapsack. He even mentions not taking sandals. He tells them to go in a very humble way. But there's a strategy behind this. Because back in those days, uh, was anybody around in the 1800s? No? Okay. Um, no. All right. Um, so... You may, know what, you may know what traveling uh, snake oil salesmen were, right? People would just go to, from town to town and put up a thing selling some magic elixir or whatever. Well, they didn't quite have snake oil salesmen back in Jesus' day, but they did have people who were espousers of particular philosophies, uh, zealots about certain things, who would go from town to town and speak and try to sell their philosophy or sell their particular take on a religion, and they would ask for money from people. And then they would just pick up and go to another town. Uh, they would go get attention, be there long enough, uh, kind of like, kind of like the play or the movie, The Music Man. That, does that resonate a little bit more? Maybe, yeah, The Music Man. So uh, they would go from place to place, and and those people were often received well, but sometimes were just looked at as the snake oil salesman that they may have been. And Jesus did not want his followers to come across that way. So he tells them to go with some humility. Don't go looking like you've got all the answers, even though you do. Don't go looking like you're just trying to sell something and then just move on. Don't go looking like you're going to be mooching off people. Go with humility. Go with humility into the towns and the places that I'm going to send you. So he sends them with that kind of posture, with a bit of a humble posture. And he tells them that when they get to a place, communicate peace. Communicate peace. If people of peace are there, then they will return your peace. But if not, the peace will return to you anyway. So he's telling them to, to be peaceful, to, ex to extend peace. And they can know whether or not there's an invitation to deeper relationship by what's given back to them. Now, that may sound obvious, but if we're sent by Jesus to go and tell people about Jesus and those people don't listen, I wonder if our inclination might actually be, no, just keep telling them, just keep telling them. Or no, we got to get it into them, we got to get into them. You know, if we're trying to save souls, you know, if Jesus says the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few, you know, if we're trying to be sure that we get a word in for Jesus with somebody, are we going to be able to stop and say, you know, that person's not returning my peace. It might not be the time. Jesus is wanting his followers to go into places and go into relationships and go into households where they're going to be received. Because even if they manage to get their foot in the door after some resistance, that's not going to be the most conducive situation for extended relationships for real deep understanding of who they are and who Jesus is. So Jesus is telling them, in a sense, not to be too anxious if your peace is not returned. Maybe it'll hurt a little bit. Maybe it'll be frustrating. But the peace doesn't just come from them. The peace comes from Jesus. It's Jesus whose peace they're carrying, and it's Jesus whose peace is getting rejected. But at some point, they're going to find people of peace. They're going to be people of peace. And Jesus is telling them not to get super anxious about how they are, are being received because they will find a hearing and a reception and an invitation at some point. So he's telling them to go with some humility and, and uh, some, um, some subtlety. 
And he's telling them to know when they are being welcomed and not worry so much about when they aren't. Finally, he's telling them what to do when they receive that peace. And we think of this as Jesus sending people to these places so that they can just tell others about him. But there's a little bit more to it than that. Back then, it was a household-based economy. So the ho each household had its own trade. Even if it was selling wares in the market or farming or, or, uh, or herding or something like that, each particular household had its trade. And Jesus says the laborer deserves his wages. And that's, uh, I know some pastors probably use that to say, you should pay your pastor. But no, what Jesus is saying is that they're supposed to be working in these households. They're not just going and dropping in and trying to sell something. Jesus is telling his friends to go into these households in these towns and work alongside the people, even living with them. Eat what they give you. Drink what they give you, which might cause some anxiety for, uh, for, for really stringent uh, Jewish young men like these, these guys were uh, because of the Jewish dietary laws. But Jesus tells them, eat what's put on your plate. Accept their hospitality receive their hospitality, and dwell with them. Don't just mooch off of them. He's telling them they need to be working. Participate in the household economy. Jesus is telling his friends to go and help people flourish, be productive, add to the goodness and the productivity of the place where you're sending. Hey, that sounds like what we heard from Jeremiah a few weeks ago. Contribute to the well-being of, of those to whom I am sending you, he's saying. So these disciples, these followers of Jesus, are being called into these homes, being sent into these homes to live with the people there. I was talking about this passage uh, in, with our, our staff this week, and, and uh, y'all may know that our, our accountant, Angel Pritchett, uh, does a, a couple hundred individual tax returns every year. Uh, so I asked her how she would respond to this if somebody came and just decided to live in her house and help her do people's taxes, um, which I, she said she wouldn't respond very well to that. And uh, I told her she's not, that's not very Christ-like. Um, but <laughs> so it was a little bit different world back then. But Jesus is telling his people to work for the benefit of those to whom he's sending them. Because when they're doing that, when they're working alongside, when you're working alongside somebody, you have conversations. You get to know the person. You develop a relationship. You develop trust. If you're just knocking on the door and selling Bibles, you're not going that much deeper than just a transaction. But Jesus is telling his followers to look for more than just a transaction. Be at their table. Work in their work. Get your hands dirty with them. Because then the opportunities for relationship and conversation can happen. On the surface, this passage is Jesus sending his friends out to tell them about Jesus. But on a much deeper level, it's way more than that. As followers of Jesus, he's sending us to be people who bless, who encourage, who develop deeper relationships, who don't just dwell on the surface with others. And if the opportunities come like they did for them, they can heal. They can proclaim that the kingdom has, of God has come near. They were going into a world that needed to know about Jesus. And a lot of them needed to know about Jesus. But instead of saying, knock on as many doors as you can knock on, do as much as you can do, be as many places as you can be, Jesus is saying, don't go from house to house. Go and dwell and be with the ones who receive you. So that is the passage in more or less a nutshell. Maybe a, maybe a walnut shell, not a pistachio shell. Now, Jesus tells his friends how to go, how to know when they're being received, and how to show who they are and who he is. But I want to back up to verses 2 and 3. Because it's easy to look for what Jesus is saying to do. But before he even tells people what to do, 
he is telling them how to be, how to orient themselves around him. And it's in that context that they do what they do. And I know we like being told what to do. I know it's, it's easy to, to, whether we're studying or listening, or we want to get to the point. It's nice to have clear points and be told what to do. But it's interesting, if you look through Scripture, you might notice that the people who just wanted to know what to do were usually the people that Jesus got most frustrated with. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Who is my neighbor? We're going to get to that one in a couple of weeks. Quite often, it's just as important how Jesus is telling us to be as it is what he's telling us to do. So we've gotten the to-do part down. That's what he was telling his disciples. But back in verses 2 and 3, we have the how-to-be part. In verse 2, Jesus says, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Now, we live in a busy world, a world that's very individualistic, that's oriented toward achievement, and we want to do the right things. We want to do good things. We hear a verse, we hear Jesus say, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And we think, oh my gosh, there's more to do than I can get done. We got to knock on every door. We got to do it all. We can't stop off. We, we, can't, we can't just wait and be with people because there's so much to do. The harvest, the harvest is plentiful. There's not enough people to do the work. There's not enough time. So much to do, not enough time, not enough help. But Jesus, with all he's telling them to do, is really saying, you know what? It's not all going to get done. Harvest is plentiful. Labors are few. Go Stay where you are sent. Develop relationships. That's what I want you to do. Don't get too anxious about everything that has to be done. It's not all going to get done. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. We're going to work with what we got, and you're going to go develop relationships, and you're going to proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near. In a couple weeks, we'll see their report back, at which Jesus greatly rejoices. But our inclination as busy people, might be, oh my goodness, it's all got to get done. Not enough people to do it. Not enough time to do it. I think that <laughs> maybe we don't all feel that way about our lives. But if we view this through a lens of grace, the message is you're not going to be able to do everything. But you can do some things one particular thing, very, very well. And Jesus is calling his friends to focus. Now, if that resonates, that strain and stress resonates, I wonder if it resonates more now than it did maybe three years ago, February 26th, 2020. Four years ago, February 26th, 2019. Because over the last few years, maybe you've experienced this in your families, your workplaces, the base level of anxiety and stress and strain and grumbling and complaining in the world has just risen and risen a lot. I mean, y'all probably know what the symptoms of COVID are, right? Stress, discontent, frustration, anger. No, those are, sorry, those are the emotional symptoms of what we've all been through for the past few years. I mean, you know, there's the sore throat and the fever and the, the, uh, the, the breathing issues and all of that. And, you know, long COVID is the extended fatigue. But in another sense, the entire world has long COVID right now. Churches have long COVID. Organizations have long COVID. People are more frayed and fragile and reactive than they've ever been. And I know this might sound like complaining for me, but I've thought about saying this a lot of times, and it wasn't really until the National Gathering this year, the Eco National Gathering, when that was the main theme, and everybody's saying, yes, we're feeling this in, in our churches, but our people are also feeling this 
in their families, in their workplaces. There's a lot to be upset about in the world right now. And we're all carrying part of that. And everybody's carrying, carrying part of that everywhere. We're not special. But that's everywhere in the world. And you go out into the world and there's, there's that heightened level of frustration that just maybe seems like it wasn't there before. And uh, it, <laughs> how often is peace returned to you when you extend peace? I'd say probably 20% less often than it was three years ago. And how often are you the one who leads with that peace? Now, as followers of Jesus, in a place where the harvest is plentiful and maybe more plentiful than it's ever been and the labors are few and maybe fewer than they've ever been, are we still able to go out with that posture of, the, of being those who extend peace first and foremost? Because if we can do that, and if we can dwell rather than be hurried and harried like Jesus is telling his disciples to do, then <laughs> that in itself Maybe proclaiming that the kingdom of God has come near. It would be better for us in our mental and emotional state, but better for anybody around us too. You know, if we can be people who go out with, with that kind of posture in this kind of world, then, then we're just the kind of people who can pull this off that Jesus is talking about, who can help the flourishing of those around us. And I know that just sounds like one more thing to do and to put on your to-do list. Extend peace. Ah, that's one more thing I have to do. No. Nah. It's not just what Jesus is telling us to do. It's how he's telling us to be. And we have to cultivate that. And when he says that, he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers into the harvest. We pray to the Lord of the harvest to be able to demonstrate peace in a world that has very little of it. And if we dwell and if we invest... And if we have relationships with people, then, you know, we might just get more labors out of it, too. If Jesus' disciples had just gone from door to door to door and, and, and just told people about Jesus, then they would, the harvest would have still been plentiful. There's always going to be plenty of harvest out there. But they wouldn't have gotten any more labors. But by dwelling with people and working with people and helping people, you might actually make a few more labors there. And Jesus calls us to be laborers together. That brings us to verse 3. I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. That sounds pretty dangerous, right? I mean, wolves are dangerous. Wolves eat sheep. Interestingly, sheep eat grass and wolves eat sheep. But neither one of them like the fence. Wolves are dangerous, yes. And he's not telling them to go out and be worried about wolves. I mean, that's a little bit of it. There are wolves out there. There are people who aren't going to like what they're doing. There are Pharisees and whatnot. But if they're demonstrating their value, then they're, they're likely to, to get along okay. Jesus is telling them that he's sending them out as lambs. They are not the predators. They aren't just going looking for converts. Jesus is sending them out as lambs dwell and be peaceful, be humble, and be meek. Now, there are wolves out there, and they're going to have to watch out for that. And I don't do any shepherds? Shepherds? Shepherds, no shepherds. First service had like six. They didn't. If you're familiar with sheep, uh, you may know the behaviors of sheep and what defense mechanisms they have. Uh, sheep have three different dis defense uh, responses. One the main one is that they flock. They flock together. Most of them, they all look pretty similar to one another. So when they flock, it's harder to pick one out. And they can look bigger, almost like a bigger organism. There's an importance in flocking. You know, Jesus is only sending his followers out two by two here, but they all come back to him. They all come back and report. Jesus is telling them to flock together, stick together, be with brothers and sisters in the faith. Following Jesus is not a, a solo project. It's a collaboration. And we want to encourage that. That's why we take vows when people join as a whole congregation. That's why we take vows when they're baptized. So sheep flock. 
That's, that's an obvious one. Y'all probably knew that. Sheep also run away. They know when their peace is not being returned or when somebody who's not giving peace is coming in. Sheep run away. That's, that's their other defense mechanism. But a third defense mechanism for sheep, and I, I tried to, I, I Googled this this week. That was, my, uh, that was my commentary for the week for this passage. And uh, sometimes you see this when you're looking up, if you're Googling defense responses of sheep, and sometimes you don't. But sheep actually also charge. And you may have known that about rams, but even ewes charge from time to time. And even if you can't find it on Google, just go to YouTube and look for videos of sheep charging people, and you'll have a good laugh for a little while because there are a lot of those. Sheep also charge. Now, what is a sheep going to do to a wolf if it charges a wolf? Not going to cause a lot of damage. But y'all have dogs, right? I love dogs. Don't get me wrong. Wolves are canines. It's not hard to confuse a dog. And dogs are naturally, in their core, at their core, predatory beings, right? What happens if you run away from a dog? It's going to chase you. What happens if you run out of dog? It's going to get a little confused. It might dance around. It might bark. That bark is a, that's a dog's way of having a DTR conversation. You know what DTR is? Do we have enough singles here in North Augusta? DTR means define the relationship. Uh, a dog is asking you to have a define the relationship conversation. Let the dog know what's going on because it's, it wants instructions from you. It's a dog. But it's, it's not that hard to confuse a dog. And when a sheep charges a predator, it can disorient the predator, right? So important to remember in this is that the sheep hold the ground. The sheep hold the field. You know, predators just raid. Wolves raid and dart in. Wolves are, are experts at trying to cause confusion and relying on that confusion. Wolves are experts at going and picking off one animal and kind of teaming up on one or two and then getting out of there. But the sheep hold the ground. It's the sheep's field. It's not the wolf's field. And if suddenly there are sheep charging them, the wolf is going to think twice about trying to take that, trying to take on that flock. It's disorienting, it's just unusual. It's not the way things are supposed to happen. Now, can that sheep do that much damage? Probably not. But they can disorient the wolf long enough. So where I'm going with this is that, yes, Jesus sends us out as sheep. But every now and then we get a moment to charge. And not like headlong headbutting people, but if we see disorientation in people's lives, which there may be more of now than any other time, the way is open for proclaiming that the kingdom of God has come near. Because it sure doesn't feel like it sometimes out in the world. But the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God has always come near. The kingdom of God has come near in Jesus. And he can send us out to proclaim that. He can send us out into a disoriented world with the posture of sheep. And, you know, don't be rude when you charge, but there's a lot to be said for the disorientation in the world now. And the fact that we have the opportunity to be the people who can lead with peace, and when it's received, delve deeply into relationship. Not just for others' sake, for our sake as well. For the sake of being connected, for the sake of knowing Jesus, for the sake of growing ourselves. Jesus tells his disciples how to go, how to know when they're being received, what to show people. But he also sends them with a posture that will help them understand him just as much as those to whom he's sending them. As we go out from here, let us be those kind of people who go with peace who don't get so flummoxed by the harvest that we forget our task of being his disciples and being sent. And who know that he has sent us as sheep to be with those whom he has also called. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this charge and this calling. Send us out into a flustered and disoriented world. 
oriented around you. Send us out with that proper posture so that we may serve and proclaim that your kingdom is near. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now will you stand and join me in saying what we believe using, our, using the Apostles' Creed, our affirmation of faith, which is printed in your bulletins and appears on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As you go, go as those whom Jesus has sent into a great harvest that is called to be sheep in the midst of wolves. Not fearful always, but mindful of who he is and that his kingdom is near and that he's called you to dwell with others and grow in him and see them do the same. As you go, may the hands of Christ tend your wounds. May the Holy Spirit bring to your minds just the things that you need to hear. May he dwell in the Father's arms at the last. Thank you.